Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. And thank God for Inquisition Update. We're continuing our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power, by R.W. Thompson. Yesterday, we concluded with uh, a recitation of the uh, creation of the Jesuit order. What was the purpose of the Jesuit order? It was a militia formed outside the church that had no real religious value at all, but a militia that operated outside the church in every nation among every people to influence and to establish or reestablish the temporal power of the Pope and to destroy Protestantism. And every Jesuit is a mind slave to the Jesuit general. Every Jesuit priest is sworn to obey the Jesuit general as though he were a member of his own fleshly body, that he was to have no thought or will of his own, no earthly ties, and that means no father, no mother, no brother, no sister, no nation, no wife, no other obligation, no other purpose in life but to obey implicitly the Jesuit general and to think as he thinks and to do as he does and to be a warrior, unconcerned even of his own life, to help establish the Pope's kingly power over the whole world. It's a global contest. It's admitted as such. And the papacy, when it first conceived what, the, what Ignatius Loyola had proposed, said that the constitutions of the Jesuits were as though they were written by the very finger of God. And that's how the Jesuit order got its start. You know its purpose, and you know its power. Or if you don't, if you'll continue listening to Inquisition Update and this author, R.W. Thompson, you will certainly know what the Jesuit order is all about. Now, there was only one hitch in Ignatius Loyola's get-along that stood in the way of the formation of the Jesuit order. In other words, the, the final okay by the papacy. And we're going to deal with that briefly now as we continue on line three of page 109 in the book, if you're following along. It says it is stated by McLean in a note to Mosheim's Ecclesiastical History that when Ignatius Loyola first laid before Pope Paul III the plan for the organization of his society and desired his approval of it, there was a provision which restricted somewhat the promised obedience to the Pope. This having given rise to objection, it was so changed as to bind the order, that is the Jesuit order, quote, by a solemn vow of implicit, blind, and unlimited submission and obedience to the Roman pontiff, unquote, which removed every obstacle. So once this provision was made, we're off to the races. We have an officially sanctioned militia for the Pope created for one purpose and one purpose only, and that was to, to elevate the papacy to world sovereign kingly status. Now, the author continues, he says, Herein lies the true secret of the papal attachment for this mysterious organization. It accounts for its reestablishment during the present century by Pope Pius VII. Remember, they were suppressed in 1773, and 37 years later, by Pope Pius VII, they were reestablished after the papacy became intimately familiar with just how difficult it would be for the papacy to even survive without the Jesuit order leading the charge to elevate it to world supremacy. It says, uh, 
It accounts for its reestablishment during the present century by Pope Pius VII and the readiness with which Pope Gregory XVI subsequently permitted the Jesuits to direct his pontificate. That's right. These, these rowers of the Pope, rowing the bark of Peter to world supremacy, were even directing Pope Gregory's pontificate. And it says they were vigorous and experienced rowers, and in consideration for the privilege of shaping the policy of the papacy, they were always ready to obey the papal commands, although in doing so they should be required to put themselves in secret and insidious conflict with all existing governments. Now, if they're going to raise the papacy to a world sovereign kingly status, king of kings and lord of lords, and they're going to do it against the protests of any recalcitrant national kings who don't want the Pope's interference, they're going to be in, the, the Jesuits are going to be in direct opposition to that government, aren't they? That's right. Even the government of the United States of America if it asserts that the people are going to tell it what to do and how to govern this nation, then the Jesuits are going to be a genetic enemy of this government. If you, if you, get, if you catch my drift. The Jesuits were an insidious enemy of all existing governments because those existing governments had thrown off the papal yoke and had decided to raise up governments of, by, and for the people, constitutions, declaring the rights of the people and stripping the Pope of his rights to govern. That automatically makes this Jesuit order the enemy, the sworn, and I use the term again, genetic enemy, of every human government that is not completely submissive to the Pope of Rome. Now, it says, undoubtedly, Pope Gregory XVI understood this when finding the people of Italy and other European states struggling hard for republican forms of government and seeing the temporal scepter slipping from his hands he declared that he was not Pope anywhere else in the world except in the United States. Now, did you get that? Having divorced itself from the papal throne, from the papal authority, all of Europe rejected the papacy. That mortal wound was inflicted in Europe. The papacy was wounded. He could not command the kings of the earth anymore. Only one place on earth was the Pope still revered, and that was in the United States of America. And it says, It should excite no surprise that the present Pope, Pius IX, in the midst of still greater embarrassments, should suffer similar thoughts to obtain possession in his mind, inasmuch as by the same attachment to the Jesuits, he has equally secured their services and devotion. That's right. Pope Pius IX would not have survived had it not been for the Jesuit order. And it says, When, at the beginning of his pontificate, he was supposed to be influenced by other motives, and gave assurances that many of the abuses in the civil government of Rome should be reformed, he felt himself secure in his position without their aid, that is, the aid of the Jesuits. But after he has lived to realize what Pope Gregory XVI so much feared, the loss of his temporal power, he, like him, Pope Gregory, trust the papal bark to the same vigorous and experienced rowers, that is the Jesuit order, hoping that it may find safe mooring in the United States 
realizing as he does that it is only under the shelter of Protestant toleration, that is, religious liberty in this country, that the members of this proscribed society, the Jesuit order, can now find a resting place. So the Jesuits had been kicked out, the Pope had been ignored and put back in his papal box, but the Jesuits and the Popes found refuge here in the United States. Refuge and support. The Jesuits were free to erect colleges and universities and begin once again educating the boys and giving confessions to the kings of our country. And that by that, they got control of this country, just like they did every country in Europe before they were found out and evicted. Isn't it extraordinary that all of Europe woke up but America never has. America has never acknowledged the insidious schemes of the Jesuits in this country. And it's all because of our constitutional liberty of, of, of freedom of religion. Generally, Protestants accept that the Roman Catholic Church is just another denomination of the Church of Jesus Christ. What a grievous error. It is not the Church of Jesus Christ. It is the antithesis. That's mistake number one. And mistake number two is to not study the history of the Roman Catholic Church. Once one realizes that it is not Christ's Church then one is awakened to the possibility that it may be a threat to Christ's church. And that would be the legitimate motivation to study this church and to study its militia and to discover what they did in Europe that so outraged the Catholic nations of Europe that they were deposed God help that wisdom to come to Protestant America and to do it before it's too late, that some might be saved. And it says, Therefore, in June of 1871, on the 25th anniversary of his coronation as Pope, when he addressed a deputation of Roman Catholics from the United States, he was led on by the earnestness of his zeal to speak of this country as if he considered it the last and only hope for the papacy. The number of his, of his disputation, of excuse me, the number of this deputation was only 26. But the imaginative Pope became so enthused that he exclaimed, Look at all America! evidently considering them as representative of the whole nation. After one of the priests, the Reverend Mr. Leray of the Natchez Diocese, had delivered to him an address on behalf of the bishops, clergy, and the laity of that diocese, the quote-unquote Holy Father made a response in which the following sentences occur, quote, I have heard of what has been doing in America in favor of the vicar of Jesus Christ, that is, the Pope, of the meetings that have been held there. I have continually received testimonials of attachments and proofs of devotion from the Catholics of the United States, devoted not only of the mind and the heart, but of the hand, too. The bearing of the Catholics of the United States fills me with the hope of the future of the Church. You are a numerous people, and I know you have all kinds of men among you. There is a party of opposition who teach everything contrary to law and order, men who have gone among you to disseminate every kind of evil, who have no reverence for God or His law, but still the progress of Catholicity is such as to fill us with well-grounded confidence for the future. There was a cardinal once who was a prefect of the congregation. He was wont to prophesy about America. It was a prophecy in a broad sense, 
He used to say so earnestly that the salvation of the Roman Catholic Church would come from America, that it made a deep impression upon me, and I hold to it, said the Pope. I believe the great blessings will come to the faith from America, and I pray for you always that God may spread his truth among you and that they may take deep root, flourish, and bear fruit." Unquote. That was the hope of Pope Pius IX, that the survival of the church, which means the survival of the papacy, once so completely challenged by Roman Catholic Europe, that salvation would come from Protestant America. That was his hope, that the Catholics in this country, left free to worship and to do as the Pope declares, and not resisted as they were in Europe, but free to do as the Pope commands, would be the very salvation of the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church. Now, does Revelation chapter 9, uh, 13 make more sense? This is prophesied in the Bible, that it would be the United States of America, the second beast, the beast that rose up out of the wilderness, that would cause the whole world to worship the first beast, the papacy. My uncle once told me, he said, Tom... I just can't find the United States in Bible prophecy. I can't find the United States anywhere in the Bible. The greatest nation to ever exist in the world, I cannot find it in the Bible. It's got to be there. Either that, or when Christ comes, it's either going to be destroyed before He comes, or we're all going to be raptured out of here. And I looked at him and I said, Uncle Bob, it isn't the latter. The United States is in Bible prophecy. It's Revelation chapter 13, the wilderness beast. And it's not good news. Not good prophetic news at all. This Pope found the salvation of the Roman Catholic Church in America. The Church of Antichrist will spring back to life. That mortal wound will be healed by the United States of America. It will be the United States of America and its Jesuit priests and its Jesuit-controlled government that will conquer the rest of the world for the Pope. The United States is nothing more or nothing less than a papal proxy warrior. That's why this country has the biggest and best navy in all the world, so that it can go all over the world to impose its will on the whole world. And we're not doing it for the benefit of Protestantism. We're not doing it for the benefit of Christ Church. We're doing it for the benefit of the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church. And a careful study of history, as this author, R.W. Thompson, will give us, will sh clearly show that this nation fights its wars for the purpose of elevating the papacy to global supreme command and authority. Now, the author continues, he says, This language is not difficult of interpretation. Its import can be easily perceived. Manifestly, the amiable, the amiable old pontiff has suffered himself to be persuaded into the belief that the Roman Catholics alone, that the Roman Catholics of America alone are the lawful possessors of the United States, and that the Protestants composing a party of opposition of all kinds of men have gone among them teaching everything contrary to law and order and every kind of evil without any uh, reverence for God or His law are going to have to be destroyed. 
He says he seems to think that this state of things cannot last always because the Catholics of the United States are devoted both in the mind and the heart and the hand, too, to the removal of the evil of Protestantism out of the way. That's the goal of Roman Catholicism in this country. That is the goal of the Roman Catholic hierarchy. Listen, common sense has to dictate in your mind, if you're reasonable, that if it is the intent of the Jesuits and the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope himself to become the divine right ruler of the whole world, which they admit, then you must understand that Protestantism is its mortal enemy. And that to succeed, Protestantism must be destroyed. I want my listeners to comprehend and wrap your brains around what I find most Americans are repulsed by and turn right around and call me a hater of all things, for heaven's sake. I'm not a hater. I'm trying to bring Roman Catholics in this country to the same rational realization that possessed the Catholics of Europe that threw off the papal scepter, that kicked the Jesuits out of their country, and that demanded civil and religious liberty and restored peace. And I'm trying to convince Protestants and Catholics that the Roman Catholic Church is not the Church of Jesus Christ. It is not Christianity. It is anti-Christianity. Now, if anybody could legitimately describe that as hatred, then I will admit to being a hater. But why do you hate me? Because I tell you the truth. It's a bitter pill to swallow. I understand that. But it's a reality. The Roman Catholic Church in America, to achieve its ends, must destroy Protestantism and our Protestant Constitution deny the people of America any religious liberty, deny them any religious speech, deny them any religious press, and make them Catholic by law, enforceable, as always in Roman Catholic history, by a sentence of death. And this author is going to confirm what I've just told you. R.W. Thompson leaves no stone unturned. This is the ultimatum. He said that if this great republic ever falls, it won't be from an outside enemy. It will come from within, and it will be the Roman Catholic Church. And that day has arrived. And you can explain everything that happens in history and in current events by Rome's influence upon our government and our laws and even in our Protestant evangelical churches. The Pope was really impressed with the reception he got by these 26 delegates who received him into their company here in America. The Pope was flattered. And he gave it the mission of the Roman Catholics of this country to overthrow Protestantism. That's what he did. And, his, and the author says, manifestly, the, am the amiable old pontiff has suffered himself to be persuaded into the belief that the Roman Catholics alone are the lawful possessors of the United States. And that the Protestants, composing a party of opposition of all kinds of men 
having gone among them, teaching everything contrary to law and order and every kind of evil, without any reverence for God or his law. He seems to think that the, the state of things cannot last always because the Catholics of the United States are devoted in the mind and the heart and in the hand, too, to the removal of the evil of Protestantism out of the way. This is why this, this, project, this program is called Inquisition Update. They're going to remove Protestantism out of the way by their traditional means. Force, slaughter, murder, torture, deprivation of property, deprivation of life. Now, Says R.W. Thompson, this pope is not censurable either for this belief or the words in which he expresses it, having no knowledge of the temper of our people or of the nature and the spirit of our institutions in any other wise than he esteems them to be an antagonism, an antagonism to his papacy. His followers mislead him by their intemperate zeal and wild prophecies of success. And here, the, note, the author gives us a note. There were prophecies issued about the United States. He says, after Victor Emmanuel occupied Rome, numerous indignation meetings were held in the United States. That's right. The Catholics in the United States were incensed that a secular king had liberated Rome from papal authority. That's right, Catholics in Protestant USA were very much concerned about the conditions in Italy, and Rome in particular. The Pope had been stripped of his papal states. Italy had rebelled against the Pope and established its own government independent of the papacy. The Catholics in this country were outraged. It says, after Victor Emmanuel, who liberated Rome, numerous indignation meetings were held in the United States. The Catholics all got together to express their indignation against Victor Emmanuel. And it says, at one of these meetings in Binghamton, New York, after high mass, it was resolved, quote, that we will freely, if necessary, devote our worldly goods and our lives in defense of the church's doctrines and in the restoration of the temporal power of the visible head of the church, which is typical language to describe the pope, the visible head of the church. The pope is the visible head according to them, of the Roman Catholic Church, and they'll do anything they can to restore the Pope's temporal power that was stripped from him by Victor Emmanuel. And it says another of these meetings in Jackson, Mississippi, it was said, quote, As American citizens, we feel that we are entitled to the protection of our government in our vested rights, which have been violated by the Piedmontese government, etc., that's a call for our government to uphold their rights. Rights that are derived from the Pope. In other words, the Roman Catholics in this country feel it a personal insult that Victor Emmanuel overthrew the power of the papacy in Italy and Rome. And they want the government of the United States to restore the temporal power of the Pope in Italy. They want the government to protect their rights. What, are they, what do they mean? They mean that their rights dictate that the Pope be restored his power in Italy. That's a call for a papal proxy war. That's a call for the United States government to get involved in the internal political and religious affairs of Italy to restore the Pope's temporal power. 
this is the this is the very beginning of what I've been saying all along that the United States of America is reduced to nothing more than a papal proxy warrior for the Pope. And the Roman Catholics in this country demand that our tax-paid dollars, our tax-paid armies and navies and air forces and marines and the CIA and everybody work together in unison under the cover of other auspices to restore the temporal power of the Pope all over the world. That's what's happening right before our very eyes. He goes on with this note, he says, at another of these meetings in Los Angeles, California, the Pope is spoken of as the pontiff king of more than 200 millions of every tribe and tongue and nation. Roman Catholics in California proclaiming the Pope to be king of the world. And that this nation ought to come to his rescue. And it says, and protests like these were gathered into a single sheet and sent to the Pope. What do you think that communication meant to the Pope? We hear you, Pope. We American Catholics, we hear you, and we have power in this country, we have equal votes with Protestants, and we're going to turn this government, and we're going to use it to reconquer those lands stripped from your authority by popular governments. And do you know what that does? That puts every Roman Catholic in direct antithesis to the very government that gives them the liberty to be Catholic without interference the liberty to speak their mind, the liberty to print, the liberty to worship as Catholics without restriction, as they suffered in England. Isn't it extraordinary? Do my listeners really comprehend what this is all about? If you'd like to respond, I'd like to entertain responses from the listeners if it's sinking in, what is happening here? Email me, tom at cwaves.us. Tom at cwaves.us. Has this opened your understanding to what has happened in history and what is happening in the world today and what role the United States plays in the global establishment of the Pope's new world order as the world's policeman, as the warring nation that we've become? Do you understand now that our, that our wars are not fought for the sovereignty, to maintain the sovereignty of this nation, but to maintain the sovereignty of the Pope? That's what I assert. That's what R.W. Thompson says. This nation will be reduced to fighting the Pope's wars if we allow the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy to control the government of the United States of America. And it will fulfill Bible prophecy, Revelation chapter 13. Are we to stand silently by and not decry this because it's written in the Bible, Revelation chapter 13? Should we just accept that Bible prophecy will be fulfilled without, without any controversy? Just allow this nation to be used lock, stock, and barrel for the purposes of the Pope's world conquest? Well, it's prophesied in the Bible. I guess that's the way it's supposed to be. No, we can't change Bible prophecy, and we can't change the direction that the United States is going to go. It's prophesied in God's book. God has spoken. That's what's going to happen. We can't stop it, but we don't have to be a part of it. And we can warn others not to be a part of it. That's our Christian duty. As Bible-believing Christians, we need to pronounce the Pope Antichrist, the Roman Catholic Church, the synagogue of Satan, declare that they have control in Washington, D.C., that they're conquering the world for the Pope, and they're ready to kill anybody that gets in their way 
especially one called Protestant. You know, Greg Szymanski one asked, asked, asked me one time, he said, Tom, now that you know what you know, could you ever be silent about it? And I answered, Greg, I won't be silent about this until God takes my last breath. And I challenge my listeners, how can you know what you know and remain silent about it? How can you in good conscience know this information? Comprehend it in your mind and know it to be true and remain silent. Has God given us a spirit of fear? He continues with this note, and he says, And protests like these were gathered into a single sheet and sent to the Pope. In other words, they're, they're, they're communicating to the Pope. If it is possible for the Catholics in the United States to restore your temporal power in Italy and in Rome, that we will do. Americans, Roman Catholics, no doubt, but Americans are saying that we're going to restore your temporal power in Italy and in Rome. Now, do you think they might be interested in restoring his temporal power in the United States of America, too? Realizing that the government under which they live here in America is just as rebellious, according to the Pope and according to their Roman Catholic sentiments, as was the government established by Victor Emmanuel. These Roman Catholics are publicly declaring their opposition to our Republican form of government in support of the papacy against Victor Emmanuel. They've uncovered their own designs for this country. How can they wish to restore the temporal power of the Pope in Italy and in Rome and not the United States of America. Common sense dictates that the number one enemy of this country is Roman Catholicism, not Islam. Roman Catholicism. And in reference to another great demonstration of protest in Minnesota, where an immense multitude pledged, quote, their lives, if need be, to restore the sovereign pontiff to his rightful throne and drive from the sacred city, that's their description of Rome, the sacred city, the hirelings of the, ro the tyrant robber. It was said in the same paper, quote, those resolutions may seem to some to sound like bombast, and indeed, there is reason to think so now, when the rights of Roman uh, uh, Catholic American citizens can be outraged in Rome without incurring the displeasure of our present rulers. And it says, listen to this part. It says, but the day may not be far distant when they may have again, as we have had before, a president in Washington, D.C., who will protect these rights, the rights of Catholics, a president in Washington, D.C., who will protect those rights, and then we will show those people that we mean something more than simply putting resolutions on paper. They're playing in their hand. Someday we're going to get control of the White House. And all these protests that we're throwing up in opposition to Victor Emmanuel's secular government in Italy and in Rome, we're going to be able to motivate an army. And we're not going to make just resolutions on paper. We're going to take action. If the opportunity ever arises for the Roman Catholic Church to control this government to the point that they can rise, they can raise the American army to defend the Pope around the world, that's what they intend to do. And that's what they've done. Now, continue with the text. It says, Nevertheless, 
he has informed enough to know that he has in information enough to know that his hope and expectation are chiefly based upon the fact that there is no other place in the world except under the protection of Protestant toleration where the papal defenders possess the freedom necessary to avow the principles of the papacy without molestation and without incurring such opposition from governments and peoples as has already dealt it a death blow in every Roman Catholic country in Europe. There's the mortal wound, the death blow, that Europe levied upon the papacy. The mortal wound is going to be healed by the United States of America. Roman Catholic and papal controlled Roman Catholic. Uh, the United States of America. That's how the mortal wound is going to be healed, by Protestant America. We're healing our own inquisition. We're healing our own inquisitor. Do you see what damage the ecumenical movement has done? Vatican Council II... Nothing but evil has come out of Vatican Council II. It has destroyed Protestantism. There's no protest anymore. R.W. Thompson foresees this back in 1876. He sees how the Roman Catholic Church is going to use this country, and he wrote this book to warn the American people. As I've said before, this book should be read in every Christian church in this country, Catholic churches as well. Because don't ever forget that it was Roman Catholic Europe that threw off the papal yoke. There's still hope that Catholics who sincerely love Jesus Christ would come to their senses and realize what the papacy really represents and do as did the Catholics of Europe. Demand that the, that the Jesuits be evicted out of this country as they were in Roman Catholic Europe, and the Pope go back to Rome where he belongs and rule over the street sweepers in Vatican City where he belongs. So that they'd be free to worship God in spirit and in truth and not under the dictation of the Pope and his priesthood. This book should be read by every American. It says, Undoubtedly he relies upon this toleration as opening a broad field of papal operations. That's right. He views the toleration of religious liberty of the United States of America to open up a broad field for papal operations. You see why I say this is one of the most prophetic books I've ever read? This Pope undoubtedly relies upon religious toleration in this country as opening a broad field for papal operations. And this explains World War I and World War II and the Vietnam War and the Korean War, and the current war on terror. These are papal operations. He says, and hence the exceeding activity of his Roman Catholic priestly hierarchy in the United States in executing the task he has assigned them. The Pope has assigned them a task. That's why you see Roman Catholic priests so frequently on Fox News. They're promoting the Pope's agenda in the mainstream media. Why? Because they're, they're promoting the Pope's agenda in Washington, D.C. And they're on the news to declare it. He says, Pope Pius IX has none of the private vices of Gregory XVI. Apparently, Gregory XVI was a scoundrel. 
And Pope Pius IX didn't have any of the so-called vices that Gregory XVI had. And it says, and many other popes to answer for. <laughs> and it says, his purity of life being freely admitted on all hands, but he is nonetheless ambitious on that account, nonetheless under Jesuit control, and nonetheless resolved upon employing all his pontifical power to strike down everything and to abrogate every constitution and law which stands in the way of the complete triumph of papal absolutism over the entire world. Evidence of the, evidences of this abound in all the history of his pontificate since flight from Rome to escape the vengeance of his Roman Catholic subjects. That's right, the Pope, Pope Pius IX, was under threat from Roman Catholics in Europe. And that's why he came to the United States of America and had all of his hopes placed on the Roman Catholics of the United States, where he was still king. It says, while assigning these purposes to the Pope and his hierarchs, however... We should not fail to keep in mind the distinction between Roman Catholicism as a system of religion and the papacy as an all-absorbing religio-political power founded upon human ambition. The Pope says it's founded on Jesus Christ. R. W. Thompson says the papacy is founded upon human ambition. And that's exactly what it is. He continues, he says, nor should we forget that that distinction, which exists to a great extent, especially in the United States, between intelligent Roman Catholic laymen and the Roman Catholic priesthood. There are thousands of these laymen who do not or cannot, in their consciences, approve of all that is done and said in behalf of papal supremacy in this country in any other sense than as they suppose they suppose it to involve the mere triumph of their religious beliefs over all opposing forms of faith. They believe Protestantism to be error, and all its forms of religion to be false, and yet, in return for its toleration to them, would be perfectly willing to extend that same toleration to it, even where they had the power to withhold it. But these men, good and faithful citizens in all other respects, suffer themselves to occupy a false position by allowing their acquiescence in that to, to which their judgment does not assent to be inferred from the silence which the papacy imposes upon them. But the priesthood, especially the Jesuit priesthood, compose an entirely distinct and different class. They are educated, instructed, drilled, and set apart for the special work in which they are engaged with no other thoughts to occupy their minds and no other earthly objects to accomplish. They are the servants of the papacy in the same sense in which a slave is a servant to his master and are indebted to the Pope for all the enormous power they employ." They, they swear allegiance and obedience and submission to him as the infallible vicar of Jesus Christ and perfectly well understand that if they fail to render this obedience and submission to the full extent demanded by the Pope, their official robes would be instantaneously stripped off. They are simply a band of ecclesiastical office holders held together by the cohesive power of a common ambition as compactly, <clears throat> as compactly as an army of soldiers and are govern, governed by a commander-in-chief whose brow they would adorn forever with a kingly crown and who wields the papal lash over them with imperial threatenings. There's hope for the Roman Catholic people to understand what's going on and side with the Protestants to boot these priests out of this country, just like Europe did. Can we do it? Will we do it? Or will we just acquiesce by our silence? 
I'm not going to be quiet. See you next time on Inquisition Update.